Underlying my ramblings over the next 40 minutes are three main points. One, Germany is a country of immigration. Two, media hype and political failures, not refugees or migrants, are responsible for right-wing attacks and the rise of right-wing extremism throughout Europe. And three, only broad coalition building and substantial investments in people can solve the crisis. The younger ones, although there aren't that many younger ones among you, but there are some, uh, they were not born then in 1992 uh, when Germany actually faced a somewhat similar uh, situation. Due to the war in what was then still Yugoslavia, hundreds of thousands of refugees, we called them asylum seekers then, arrived in trains via Austria at German borders. That's because at the time, Germany had still one of the most liberal asylum laws in the world. All you had to do at the border was say the word Azul and it automatically granted you the right to a proper legal proceeding to determine your eligibility for asylum. Um, so less, this was less than two years after Germ German unification, less than three years after the, wall of the, Berlin, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. West Germany was already in the process of absorbing millions of internal migrants from the e East in search of employment and education. The unemployment rate, which had skyrocketed in 1990, had just come down again. At the height of the crisis, there were over 430,000 asylum seekers. Today, that period is known primarily for its darkest hours, attacks on asylum seeker homes in Rostock, Lichtenhagen, East Germany, where almost 3,000 ordinary citizens applauded several hundred right-wing extremist arsonists and prevented police and firefighters from coming to the rescue of the asylum seekers inside. 65 police were injured in the confrontation. Copycat right-wing extremist attacks followed on a number of asylum seekers' homes, powerfully portrayed in Burhan Kobani's 2014 feature film, Wir sind jung, wir sind stark, we are young, we are strong. The sinister practice has seen great popularity again in recent months. Only last year it's been mostly empty houses being prepared for refugees that were attacked, like the one outside the Stuttgart um, on the first slide. There were twice as many as attacks in the first half of 2015 than in the entire year before, and the number continues to increase. And although the number of right-wing extremist attacks continues to be much higher in East Germany, it was in West Germany, in the quaint little city of Mölln, east of Hamburg on the western side of the Elbe River, where the extremists were even more successful in 1992. In arson attacks, on the homes of two Turkish families, a dozen people were injured, some seriously, and 10-year-old Yelis Aslan, 14-year-old Ayşe Yilmaz, and their 51-year-old grandmother, Bahida Aslan, died in the flames engulfing their home on no November 23, 1992. Less than two weeks later, the government caved and agreed to change the asylum law. The so-called Azul Compromise, reached by a coalition of SPD, CDU, CSU, and FDP, went to an, into law in May 93. The agreement included the promise to establish a European asylum policy. But this has not quite happened to this day, as the non-profit organization Pro Azul commented back then, this was a victory for the street and a defeat of the rule of law. Then as now, the hysteria about the danger of new arrivals was exaggerated and false. Germany has integrated millions of new immigrants over the last few centuries. One seventh of the German population arrived as immigrants from Poland, Italy, and France between 1700 and 1900. After World War II, 11 million mostly German refugees from former held territory arrived in Germany. Between 1949 and 1961, 2.7 million arrived fleeing East Germany. Um, from 1955 to 1972, 14 million guest workers came from mostly southern European countries. It is little known that 11 million of them actually returned to their countries of origin. In 2014, 10% of people living in Germany were, uh, were foreigners. The EU average was 6.7%. This number, of course, includes EU citizens who are permitted to live and work in other member states. Um, since uh, 2014, the Syrian war and political and economic uncertainty in the entire Middle East have swept millions of refugees to Europe. Professional migrant traffickers charge thousands of euros for a seat on a dinghy that takes them from Turkey to Greece, if they're lucky. 
From there they walk, in some cases, all the way to Germany. Per capita, Sweden has taken in the largest number of refugees in the EU. Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey are still bearing the brunt of the crisis, though. The EU system that governs refugees is a law that went into effect in 1997 known as Dublin or Dublin III. It requires refugees to apply for asylum in the first EU country they enter, and if they don't do so, they will be deported to that country. Largely landlocked Germany, which is surrounded by safe EU countries, is basically guaranteed that it will hardly ever be the first point of entry for any refugee. Someone joked that you would have literally to use a parachute to manage arriving in Germany first. Dublin punishes countries like Greece, which is struggling mightily at present, as its European allies keep building fences and closing borders. Over the past eight months, Germany has taken in the mammoth share of the refugees from the conflict zones in the Middle East. Over 1.5 million people arrived in Germany in 2015. And of course they are, they keep coming. Uh, to compare, the United States takes in about 1 million new legal immigrants a year and about <laughs> roughly 500,000 come into the country illegally every year. The government is promising to allow 10,000 refugees into the country, albeit only after a careful vetting process that usually takes up to two years. Less than half have arrived so far. Given that the U.S. is a country of over 320 million, if we were to take in the equivalent numbers of Germany, we would be taking in 4 million additional refugees a year. And of course, Germany is not only significantly smaller in numbers than the U.S., it is dramatically smaller in size the four million people would be coming just to a region the size of California. That's what you have to imagine to understand the scope of what Germany is dealing with today. And that is still only a quarter of the number of people Lebanon has taken in. So who are the refugees? They are 70% Muslim, 18% Christian. In 2015, two-thirds were male, the majority very young. About one-third are minors, a quarter of them children. The large majority come from Syria. <clears throat> In 2015, they were followed by Albania and Kosovo, two countries Germany now declared to be safe for deportation. Um, and so the numbers have come down dramatically from those countries. Um, Afghanistan is a large proportion, Iraq, Pakistan, Somalia, and, and other African countries. In, um, the majority come across the Mediterranean Sea. In 2015 alone, 3,770 have drowned on their path. Saved by the EU were 13,000. The German Navy saved, uh, saved 10,000 of those. Um, what exactly made this all happen? Um, on Monday, August 24th, German Chancellor Angela Merkel and Austrian Chancellor Feynman announced that they would suspend application of the Dublin Protocol and no longer require Syrian refugees to return to the country of first entry <coughs> to apply for asylum. This was in response to the realization <coughs> that the Balkan states were unable to handle the growing number of people coming across their borders and it was a humanitarian crisis, especially in Hungary, where people were literally standing in the streets and, and hungry and without shelter. Germany and Austria decided they would take care of processing the applications rather than sending people back. François Hollande of France did not join the decision, neither did the UK or anyone else. Although Hollande joined Merkel at a press conference expressing his hope that a new European approach to asylum would be found. EU Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker came to Merkel's aid immediately, saying, what we need and what we're sadly still lacking is the collective courage to follow through on our commitments even when they are not easy, even when they are not popular. Um, instead, what I see is pink finger pointing, a tired blame game which is not actually solving any problems. Angela Merkel, who is head of a governing coalition between the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats, is gambling her political future on this issue, and she deserves respect for her tenacity, as she is increasingly <coughs> losing support both internally and abroad. According to The Atlantic of September 12, 2015, Merkel accomplished, quote, the fastest international image makeover in recent history. <laughs> having only six months earlier been depicted by German weekly news magazine Der Spiegel as a Nazi command commander in Greece, Merkel was now hailed as an angel of mercy, 
um, by such publications as the Sydney Morning Herald, and she was awarded Time Magazine's coveted Person of the Year title page. Only the fourth woman ever, since 1936, by the way, the first woman since 1986, and only the fourth German to ever receive that honor after Willy Brandt in 70, Konrad Adenauer in 65, and of course Adolf Hitler in 1938. <laughs> <laughs> Merkel beat Uber founder Travis Kalan Kalanick and ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and of course Donald Trump. But although the, B the ministry in charge of processing refugees is overwhelmed and many local authorities are to uh, certainly overwhelmed, especially in Berlin where many refugees would like to settle down, Germany has actually been able to ha handle this large influx very well. And although the media are preoccupied with negative stories now about frustrated Germans, the opposite is still true on the ground. The Willkommenskultur is working just fine. Yes, there is an element of fatigue, and the events around New Year in Köln did not help that. I'll go into that later. But generally, Germans are still volunteering in unprecedented numbers. I spoke with a friend just on Sunday who coordinates German language courses for hundreds of refugees in a small town outside Köln. And she said she is still receiving more offers of help from tutors um, to refugee, uh, from, from retired teachers who want to tutor refugees, um, then she can accommodate. She doesn't, ha doesn't have enough refugees for all these volunteers. And I've heard similar stories from, from other cities. Many of my German friends confirm a wide gap between what is reported in the media and what they experience on the ground. The sheer volume of initiatives shows that Germans are eager and willing to show that they can and want to help those in need. At least 8% of the population are actively volunteering, and 30% more are connected with or supportive of those who are volunteering. Positive examples can be found in the most unlikely places. Frankfurt an der Oder, of all things, has become very successful at implementing integration program for new arrivals. Another example is the small town of Altena in Sauerland, about an hour and a half north of Köln, where the CDU mayor, Andreas Holstein, requested that the town be sent more refugees than it is supposed to take. Mm -hmm. His recipe for integration is dialogue with citizens and refugees. Talk about problems head on. His, uh, Holstein says he is motivated by his Christian values, but he also says he does not want to leave his children, quote, a Europe where people starve behind fences or worse, where they are shot at. I believe we are making the big mistake in Germany of addressing this problem with hysterics. Yes, it is a challenge, but who would meet such a challenge if not us in this admittedly very bureaucratic country with all the resources we have? Just as in athletics, you don't get anything without hard work. In his view, the mistakes of the past should not be repeated. Money must be spent on integration programs. His concept is quite unique and should inspire others. Altena no longer houses asylum seekers in mass accommodation. Instead, they are immediately placed in homes interspersed with the population. If you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. He says, we basically force people to engage with each other. Um, and it turns an anonymous refugee into Ahmed or Rasha or Ibrahim. The city assigns a kumara, I love that word, a kumara, a, a volunteer care worker to each family. Asked whether there are any problematic cases among the refugees, he says, let's be honest, there are some Germans I'd rather not li to, like to live with, but I have to. That's just how it is with the refugees. What's interesting is Altena is also broke. And that, the mayor says, is also its strength. When you're broke, you simply have to be creative. They established a volunteer agency several years ago. It helps them assign and train 500 to 1,000 volunteer workers. Talk about compassionate conservatism. The main public TV station, here's another picture of Altena. You see the, the beautiful castle. It's a typical little German town, mm -hmm. rural town. Um, the public um, TV station ARD, das Erste, um, has compiled a great map of activities, and you can look it up on the web, uh, in support of the refugees. And uh, information, as you can see, in, in different languages, and you can search for these initiatives by, by region. Um, 
and it's really quite impressive. This is um, Gute Ideen Bundeswehr. These are initiatives that are launched by people and some that have been portrayed in the program. And they, they told people to please stop submitting more initiatives because they could, just couldn't ha handle the volume. So this is not everything, this is just a selection of, of initiatives. Um, this is a, one example, people coming together to, to play soccer. Um, there's people collecting money for refugees to um, fund uh, courses so that they can get to school. There's a lot of church activities, um, including asylum, church asylum for those who have been who are threatened with deportation. And I love this one. This is 20 hairdressers volunteering at an asylum seeker home to cut people's hair. And um, it's just a good example of this emphasis on bringing people together and get, making them to act, actually meet each other. Uh, this is a, a search for um, donations where people can, can submit things from baby food to um, writing utensils, sewing materials, all sorts of things. Um, it's, it's really quite, quite heartwarming to see these. Um, this, and I also collected a, a number of, of um, uh, stories from the news of the recent months. And here's an example of um, a story from Bonn. Um, the, uh, the government funds language courses. And you see here a young man who just um, finished a course. He's from Eritrea. Um, and is uh, now uh, allowed to move on to the second course, which is called Integrationskurs. Um, and the first course is a 200-hour language course, followed by um, uh, Integrationskurs. And, um, and it's interesting that, that students are graded on, for example, active participation, progress, attendance, punctuality, <laughs> and professional development. You know, they need to be punctual if they want to fun function in Germany. 25% um, don't complete the course, uh, and the teachers that I've spoken with say that in many cases that is because they're too traumatized. These kids, you know, many of them have gone through what you can't imagine. And, um, and of course, many also come with practically no prior schooling or very, you know, fractured prior schooling. So that's usually the group that is most likely to, to be uh, at risk. Um, and yeah, the Integrations course is now coming for him. That's next. Um, I, I don't let's see if this works. I, I also wanted to so show you. Um, people are, you know, there's there's um, <coughs> some emphasis on oh, how much does this cost? So so this is from Süddeutsche Zeitung, which I thought was really nice. So this is the uh, money spent on um, um, on. Um, refugees. So on the left side you see the total expenses of the federal government and then next to it <laughs> you see the expenses for refugees. So I, I thought this was a really nice way. So the, the, some media are really making an effort to educate people. And here is uh, another example. Um, ta -ta -ta. So this is um, overall for 2016 what people expect. So again, this is, you know, other expenses. And then you scroll down for a long time and then comes the um, low and high estimate of what people expect to have to spend. Um, so, okay, let's see if we can <coughs> Um, how does this actually work? So the Königsteiner Schlüssel is how refugees are distributed to different towns and states in Germany based on uh, pe population size and, and uh, GDP. Um, and what's interesting is that um, this, this key was not designed for this. This key was designed to distribute research funds. Uh, and because it was there, people decided to start using it for this purpose. Um, so what you can see is there are regions that, that are wealthier, that have, uh, you know, higher populations and they, uh, I don't exactly know how they calculate it, but it's, it's done in a way to, to basically spread out the, the burden and, and the federal government is, is supporting um, a lot of these um, regions. Um, and the process takes a long time, so at first everyone needs to be registered and housed, and, and they have a medical check. 
Um, and then um, the uh, application for asylum is done in person. It has to be done in person with a, a multi-hour interview for each person. Um, and that's uh, anyone over 16 years. Um, and then there's a decision-making process, which is, of course, based on you know what uh, the interview uh, generated and also other factors like a background check and something like that, which takes two years for the United States. Um, and then the decision, uh, ha there are multiple possible decisions, so that's also really important. Um, the In a positive decision where refugee status is granted, that is a three-year temporary refugee status. That is not citizenship or, or green card-like or anything like that. It is a refugee status and it is revisited after three years. In a negative case, uh, the chances are there, there will be uh, de deportation, but there, but there's actually um, it's a lot more complicated because um, in addition to so um, people can have different levels of protection based on the situation in their country. So you may end up being rejected for refugee status, but still receive the permission to stay in the country because either your country is too dangerous to be sent back to, um, or uh, something, uh, sub it's called subsidiary protection, is those who may have to fear torture or violence if they are sent back. And then there's also temporary protection from deportation in cases where there's evident danger at present um, in the home country. So even those who are accepted as, as refugees have to be re-interviewed um, and those who are rejected may not be deported. The number of people being deported from those numbers who apply is, is relatively small. Um, a single refugee al living alone is entitled to 143 euros per month for essentials if he or she is living in a collection facility. Um, and twice that much if they live in, uh, on their own. A child receives 84 euros a month and also twice that, twice that much if they're not uh, housed in a facility. Um, housing is uh, otherwise free until the person finds work. Urgent medical care and prenatal care as well as dental care is covered as needed. After 15 months, refugees receive the same medical care as anyone in the German population. Children and young adults are entitled to free schooling. Language courses are only free for recognized asylum seekers. Others have to pay 10 euros a month. <laughs> it's like German <laughs> university tuition. <laughs> um, um, but you know, 10 euros out of 150 is a lot of money. So that is definitely not um, to be dis disregarded. Um, after. Is, refugees are not allowed to work for the first three months during their stay. Afterwards, they can work if they are employed where they are not endangering the employment of Germans. A recognized refugee is entitled to bring his or her family to Germany as well, provided housing is secured. Spouses have to prove German language skills before they are allowed to come. Um, as you can imagine, the decisions are often complicated, and even those, uh, and, and then of course the, the refugee also has the right to appeal a decision when a decision was made, which then can prolong the process. Um, so here you see the uh, uh, applications just for January. No, this is yeah, this is for just for January um, in the different. Um, states in Germany. So you see like a, town, a state like Bremen, which is tiny, has 529, and the big one, Baden-Württemberg, has 9,000 applicants. <coughs> um, and then this uh, shows you the decision making. So the green are the ones that are actually uh, admitted as refugees, and they will be allowed to stay and work. And the light green is a small number, is the subsidiary protection. And then the gray is also not even smaller, is protection from deportation. And then the light blue are the rejections. And this, this other thing is formal uh, decisions. I think that's when there are other factors involved, like they have family in another European state and things like that. So, um, and the rejections tend to be those who are from 
uh, Kosovo, Albania, and now the new Azul Paket just decided will also send people back to Morocco, Tunisia, Libya, and Algeria. Um, the um, new um, invention here is an Ankunftsnachweis, a, flüchtling, a, a refugee ID that is supposed to help people um, basically keep track of, of especially um, uh, this you know, it, huge number of people coming in and um, it, it, pro it gives people um, a chance to um, obtain uh, work and, and to get the health care and whatever else. Um, so the good news is a large number of Germans today are very much aware, as German political scientist Petra Bendel told Bloomberg's Leonard Proschitzky in an interview, that, quote, the regulations of the Geneva Refugee Convention stem from the historical experience with Jewish refugees fleeing the Holocaust. After World War II, many Germans were refugees themselves. It probably has some influence at the margins that Germans are ac acutely aware of this historical stain, and I think they are very eager to make clear that they're not that country anymore, unquote. East Germans, like Angela Merkel, also remember the upheaval in their country after the fall of the wall, and that walling off people is no solution. What those who are working with refugees talk about most is the difficulty of dealing with trauma. Over 60,000 unaccompanied children and teenagers have arrived in Germany, 3,000 just in Berlin alone. Many have lived through horrible trauma in Syria or during their flight. They are in urgent need of therapeutic and personal attention. At present, there are far more families willing to take in refugee children than there are administrators able to process the applications. So these kids literally fall through the cracks, even though there's way more families that are willing to take them in because the government hasn't invested in the, the clerks that would process these, these um, applications. The administrative chaos and uncertainty is what most people are frustrated about. It breeds mistrust in the government and it can have potentially dangerous consequences as many, especially young men, without any family or connections, are easy prey for those who wish to radicalize, abuse, or recruit them into criminal gangs. The chaos <coughs> in cities like Berlin reveals a wound that was wide open already before, left behind by severe budget cuts that was in fact also of Angela Merkel's doing. Her, her infamous Sparkurs is coming home to roost. And those correlations should not be mm -hmm. underestimated. Mm -hmm. Just as we now have to deal with the Donald Trump candidacy for president in the United States, thanks in large part to the disastrous tax policies of recent decades and the replacement of serious journalism with Fox News, people who feel they are at the losing end of the spectrum are uniting in Europe on the extreme right. Um, the group called PEGIDA, which stands for Patriotic Europeans Against Islamization of the Occident, would most likely have disappeared again had it not been given wide media attention and been able to utilize social media as a platform. Pegida formed among friends in Dresden in October 2014 and spurred similar groups other, uh, around the country. Their signature actions are Monday Spaziergänge, like vigils. Pegida rallies, as you see here, often spark counter-protests. The political wing of this uh, phenomenon is the AfD, the Alternative for, Deut for Deutschland, Alternative for Germany, which was founded in May 2013 by a 50 by 51-year-old professor of macroeconomics in Hamburg, Bernd Lucke. He has now left the party and created an, another new party. Um, but it was initially primarily a re reaction to the euro crisis, <coughs> the feeling that Germany was being victimized in the euro crisis. Um, the party did not succeed to reach the 5% of votes to make it into German parliament in the federal elections in the fall of 2013, but it did make it into European parliament in May 14 with a whopping 7.1% of votes. Today, its new leader is 41-year-old Frau Petri, a PhD in chemist, originally from East Germany, who is overseeing a remaking of the party into a right-wing extremist pendant to Le Pen in France or the Freedom Party in the Netherlands. And um, you see here how it's portrayed in the Carnival as, you know, starting out like this and becoming browner and browner, meaning more right-wing, more, more neo-Nazi-like. 
The mother of four was quoted in the press in January saying that illegal immigrants should be shot at the border if necessary. A comment that drew sharp criticism from the political establishment, but just like <coughs> Donald Trump, helped her in the polls. The AfD has chapters in all German states and is expected to come out with double-digit results in the three upcoming regional elections in Baden-Württemberg, Rheinland-Pfalz, and Sachsen-Anhalt in 10 days. Both AfD and Pegida have been tough to pinpoint politically, but are definitely attracting and courting support from right-wing extremist elements. Both are openly anti-immigrant, and here um, you saw her with her counterpart Hans Christian Strache from Austria, who <coughs> is the heir to Jörg Haider at the FPÖ, which is currently the strongest party in Austria, according to the polls, with 34% of the population supporting it. Right-wing populist parties have continuously been able to increase their base in many European countries. In Poland, the new Right and Justice Party elected in November is reforming press, freedom, and justice system. In Norway and Finland, right-wing populist parties are part of the go governing coalition. Gerd Wilders' Freedom Party is the strongest party in the Netherlands today. His Danish counterpart is second strongest in parliament. France's former national Marine Le Pen has actual chance to win the presidency. The Swiss People's Party has been the strongest party in Switzerland since 1999. Fidesz under Viktor Orban has an absolute majority in parliament in Hungary and the right-wing extremist Jobbik is the third strongest party there. Lega Nord is the third strongest in Italy. Compared to that, the German right-wing extremists are still politically small, but their support is growing among regular people. According to police reports, the large majority of arson attacks on asylum homes are perpetrated by ordinary neighbors who do not fit a set political profile. It is important to note, though, that right-wing extremist anti-refugee attacks are not the response to Merkel's decision last year. As I said at the beginning, they are a phenomenon we have known since the 90s. Indeed, Merkel even mentioned them in her decision, saying through her spokesman that, quote, Germany is a compassionate country and will not allow refugees to be met here with, by hateful slogans or alcohol-fueled loudmouths. Um, okay, I'm going to skip a little bit to get to the carnival situation. So when thousands of women were sexually attacked by large groups of immigrant men during the New Year's Eve celebrations in Köln and other cities that certainly fueled the flames. Criminal justice experts keep pointing out that there is no reason to fear refugees more than anybody else. Their crime rate is the same as the regular population. Indeed, of all refugees, Syrians and Iraqis, which are by far the largest number of recent arrivals, are the least visible in the crime statistics. Um, here you see a group of refugees actually protesting against these attacks after it happened. Um, and there's a scholar who just published uh, statistics on this. Um, I'm going to skip this. Iranian German writer Navid Kamani, winner of the most prestigious German literary prize, the Peace Prize of the Bo German Buchhandel, who actually lives around the corner from Köln main station where the attacks took place, says he was not surprised <coughs> at all by what happened. The neighborhood has had to deal with gang crimes for decades, and without downplaying what happened, he's, he's adamant about viewing Germany's efforts as a success story. Asked by Der Spiegel whether the New Year's attacks were a sign of a failed state, he, he retorts, are you crazy? His experience with German youth in schools all over the country is one of empathy, of curiosity, of what he calls with some grandiosity, political application of the Enlightenment, and quotes the Enlightenment Friedrich Hölderlin, wo aber Gefahr ist, wächst das Rettende auch. To Kermani, the real danger lies in the hysterics perpetrated by the media that overlooks all the valiant efforts by people on the ground. The connection between the media hype, the fear and the violence is something the sociologist at Ottfried Renn has studied for years, <clears throat> author of The Risk Paradox, Why We Are Afraid of the Wrong Things. He said in an interview with Die Zeit that fear is normally useful to spur reaction. But when we don't know exactly what the danger actually is, we don't know how to react, which in turn can lead to collective hysteria and the wrong decisions. Um, its artificial amplification actually increases the fear. And the Zeit also quotes economist Horst Entoff, who believes he has found the counterforce, the rationality of facts. The difficulty is that facts tend to be much harder sell than emotions. 
But luckily, many Germans, at least, are still receptive to facts. <laughs> I'm not saying the other sentence. The majority of Germans hasn't actually changed their attitude towards the refugees in the wake of the New Year's Eve um, attacks. There are large protests in support of refugees here at VW. Let's not talk about VW. Helfen statt Hansen is really a slogan, even though, thanks to the media hype, Merkel's slogan, Wir schaffen das, has become a question in many ways. Um, it is absolutely clear to most people that this crisis represents a problem of historic proportion and that it is, needs to be solved by the European Union as a whole and the international community. Um, Angela Merkel is banking on Turkey, which is about to receive 3 billion euros in aid to deal with the influx of Syrian refugees and is already asking for twice as much. Turkey, however, is view viewed with suspicion by many in the EU and in Germany for its crackdown on free speech and protesters in recent years and its treatment of its Kurdish minority. Um, so, <coughs> but Merkel is correct, of course, that it's not a German problem. She may not have foreseen in August how resistant her European counterparts would be to the idea of solving this problem collectively. Although there was a decision made to distribute at least 160,000 refugees last fall, only a couple of hundred have actually been distributed. A couple of hundred. Meanwhile, thousands continue to arrive in Greece every day. More than, now, more than a third are minors, almost two-thirds are women and children now, Worried that the borders may close, they're risking the dangerous trip. Over 400 have already drowned in the Mediterranean this year, many of them children. The conditions in Greece and neighboring Macedonia are a humanitarian catastrophe in the making. And yet one reason European leaders are hating on Angela Merkel is jealousy. A Hungarian politician called her actions moral imperialism. You really have to let that sink in. Contrary to the hopes expressed initially, Merkel lost her only ally, Austria, in January, who closed the border basically, <laughs> and her own coalition partner, CSU, has been stoking the flames at home. Tens of thousands of people trapped in Greece, um, and the numbers keep rising. The heroic efforts of the inhabitants of these islands have completely overshadowed the fact that only months before this crisis escalated last year, the media was full of reports of Greece's financial and economic crisis. Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras urged his European counterparts last Friday to share the burden of the refugees. What is needed is courageous human political and dem diplomatic action. What fuels xenophobia and right-wing extremism and what motivates young European Muslims to join ISIS by the hundreds is lack of investment in people, in jobs programs, education and affordable <coughs> housing. It is the rapidly growing disparity of wealth. That is not an earth-shattering new discovery. It's been our problem for decades. Michael Moore's very encouraging new film, Where to Invade Next, notwithstanding. He and Navid Kermani agree that Europe has done a lot more for social justice in recent decades than the US. Europe has a humane criminal justice system, excellent health care and free education for all, and still healthy labor unions, among many other good things. But underneath the surface, many inequalities have been exacerbated that undermine social justice. The financial crisis has made these growing inequalities between North and South, between East and West, more visible. It's interesting that according to a poll by the Bertelsmann Foundation, just recently, 80% of all Europeans actually welcome opening the borders and allowing refugees in. They're saying, we're 500 million, we can handle a few more million. The real problem are actually not the people but politicians driven by false motives. Rather than bickering about moral imperialism, what European politicians should do is develop a far-reaching plan. And the US has a role to play there too. Instead of becoming a dumping ground for weapons and ammunition, the Middle East needs a Marshall Plan. It needs courageous action by the international community from politicians who are less concerned with being re- or elected and more with actually solving problems. Just like we need a sensible immigration policy instead of a wall with Mexico here, Germany finally needs a real legal immigration policy, which it doesn't have. And Europe needs to come to terms with the fact that North Africa is in their neighborhood. The urgency of this cannot be overstated. And this is my... I'm going to skip this. Okay. I was recently able to see an early version of the new doc documentary, The Age of Consequences. 
Its message is very clear. Climate change will have a devastating impact on all the regions of the world that are already suffering from poverty, migration, and conflict. The apocalyptic scenarios now developing in the Mediterranean should really not surprise us. They have been predicted for decades. But to end on a positive note, the solutions to these problems are also not rocket science and have been known for a long time. When Angela Merkel opened Germany's borders last August, everyone called it a very spontaneous decision that her back was to the wall, that it was a Christian impulse. That was already part of the media hype. The truth is that already in November of 2014, the High Commissioner of the UNHCR was traveling around European capitals begging for money in vain. The UNHCR had to cut its nutrition program for Syrian refugees in Lebanese camps by one-third in November of 2014, and by December 1st, it was simply stopped. People were freezing and starving. That's the primary reason why hundreds of thousands began making their way to Europe. It now costs eight times what it would cost to take, them, to take care of them if they had stayed in Lebanon. We, just like with climate change, we have known for day, decades what needs to be done. We know the facts. We allow the deniers to win elections at our own peril. We need investments in people, investments in the future. We shouldn't let ourselves be fooled by those who say it's too expensive. Currently, UNHCR counts about 65 million people on the move worldwide. Almost 90% of them are taken in by the poorest countries of the global south. In the case of Syria, it's Turkey, Jordan, Iraq, and Lebanon. It's a disgrace for the United States and the West. Inaction or walling ourselves off militarily will always ultimately be the more costly path. Thank you. Thank you.